Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Stephen Cave. I'm the executive director of the Lieberman Centre for the Future of Intelligence here in Cambridge. And we are very honoured and fortunate at the moment to have Professor Alison Gopnik with us as our distinguished visiting fellow. Alison has been with us now for about six weeks, and almost every day I bump into some young researcher who tells me how talking to Alison has changed their mind about this or <laughs> caused them to see something else in a new light or inspired them to take their research in a new direction. So it's been really stimulating having you here, uh, Alison. I'd like to list all of your accomplishments and accolades, but that wouldn't leave any time for the talk. <laughs> so I'll be brief. Alison did her BA at McGill in psychology and philosophy, then went on to do her doctorate at Oxford, but that's really the only blemish in another <laughs> sports career. She then went on to work at the University of Toronto before joining the faculty at Berkeley, where she's been for nearly three decades, I think. And at Berkeley, Alison is a professor of psychology and an associate professor of philosophy, and as I'm sure you all know, has done really pioneering work in child development, work that has impacted on many other disciplines from the philosophy of science to family psychology and from the philosophy of mind to artificial intelligence. As you probably also know, Alison's a very brilliant communicator. She has a column in the Wall Street Journal. And if you haven't yet read her books, all I can say is that I envy you because you still have ahead of you the pleasure of discovering them for the first time. <laughs> Now, Alison is going to talk to us today about why children are more intelligent than adults. So please join me in welcoming Professor Alison Gopnik. Thank you, Stephen. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here, particularly for this audience and particularly in Cambridge, um, which I had managed to avoid for the last 30 years. But I'm tremendously, I'm tremendously enjoying. Um, so let me start out by saying, you know, thinking about the context of the Center for the Future of Intelligence, if we want to understand things about the future of intelligence, one way to do it is by thinking about the past of intelligence, thinking about the origins of intelligence. Where does it come from, both ontogenetically in the course of our lives, and even more importantly, perhaps phylogenetically? And in particular, how did the very special and powerful kind of intelligence that we humans have where did that come from? Why did it happen? What makes it distinctive? Um, so that's a, a big question that you could ask, which is relevant to questions like whether we're going to be able to discover or create new forms of intelligence um, that might be comparable to or weaker than or stronger than the kinds of intelligence that we humans have. So imagine a, a biologist from Alpha Centauri who came to visit the Earth 150,000 years ago. And she was trying to figure out what is makes this one particular bunch of little primates that's running around on this planet different from all the other bunches of primates that are running around on this planet. Now, if she'd done that, she probably would not have seen big differences in things like whether the primates that were uh, early Homo sapiens um, could use tools or not, because we know that other primates can do that as well. Uh, she probably wouldn't have seen differences in whether or not they could pass on information culturally, although they could. Again, we know that other, other primates can do this as well. Um, things like theory of mind, which is one of the things I first started to work on. Again, we've discovered that other primates can understand other people's minds as well. So she might have seen little differences around the edges, but she wouldn't have seen enormous differences 150,000 years ago before all of our cultural evolution had kicked in. But one thing that she would have noticed is that the humans have a very distinctive life history, as biologists say. So what she would have noticed is that the course of our development is really unusual and very, very different from the developmental course of any other animal. And in particular, what she would have noticed is that humans have a much longer childhood, a much longer period of dependence than any other species. So if you look at our closest uh, primate relatives, chimpanzees, for example, this is a seven-year-old chimp in the Gombe. And by the time this chimp is seven, uh, the chimp is producing as much food as he's consuming. Um, 
Now, if you look even in forager societies, societies that have the same kind of ecology that we did when we were first evolving, oops, I guess I don't have a uh, slide for that. Um, even if you look in those forager societies, uh, that doesn't happen until uh, children are about 15. So it's twice as long a period of dependence. It's not till children are 15 at the very earliest for humans that they start producing as much food as they consume. And my son is 28, and um, in our current culture, even when they're 28, they're still, they're still paying tuition bills and rent checks. Um, uh, that might seem sort of paradoxical. Why is it that we have this very long period of immaturity that comes with such an extended investment on the part of adults? Uh, and in fact, not only is there striking evidence for this uh, change, but you know, this isn't just a kind of evolutionary just so story. We actually have fossil evidence for the change. So if you look at analyses of fossil teeth, for example, and you compare uh, the maturation of Neanderthals versus fossil Homo sapiens, you can actually use teeth to figure out, think about you know, when your adult teeth come in is a, a good marker of how quickly you mature. Um, you find that even compared to uh, Homo sapiens, ho Neanderthals were maturing more quickly, uh, even in the fossil period. Um, and then you can actually track this through the whole period of, of, uh, of human evolution, through Homo erectus and so forth. So in this relatively, relatively short period, there was a big change in our life history. And on top of that, we, again, in this relatively short period, we had a bunch of changes in our life history that seemed to have been designed to be able to take care of this flood of needy babies. And not only did the period of immaturity get longer, but uh, humans actually produce more babies than their closest primate relatives. So the typical interbirth interval for a chimpanzee is about five years. Again, even in forager cultures, humans are having babies about once every two or three years. So we not only had these needy babies, but we had more and more of them. And we seem to have developed a number of adaptations that were just designed to take care of those needy babies. So for example, again, unlike our closest primate relatives, we have what I think of as the caregiving triple threat. So we have pair bonded males. We have fathers who are actually involved in taking care of babies and are uh, pair bonded with mothers. We kind of take that for granted, but that's actually a very unusual arrangement in the mammalian world. So only about 5% of mammals uh, have this kind of pair bonding arrangement. And none of our close primate relatives do. Um, we have what a, a great anthropologist Sarah Hurdy calls alloparents. Uh, which means that non-kin are also involved in taking care of babies, uh, non-biological kin. And again, that's not true for our closest primate relatives. And we have my personal favorite, uh, grandmothers. Um, and humans are one of only two species that we know of, the other is killer whales, that where females systematically outlive their fertility. And this isn't just a matter of you know good medical care, the same thing's true for forager societies. So women are living till they're 60 or 70 in forager societies. And chimps, even in um, sanctuaries where they're, and zoos where they're very well taken care of, are not living past about 50. So they're not outliving their fertility. And again, it seems kind of evolutionarily paradoxical that uh, human uh, females outlive their fertility. And there's been a great deal of work, especially again by the great anthropologist Kristen Hawkes, um, arguing that it was actually this grandmotherly investment that enabled the uh, long period of childhood. So if you look at the survival rate of, say, two-year-olds, for example, it depends actually in forager cultures. It depends more on the resources that their grandmother can, can provide than the resources that their, father, their mother or even father can provide. Um, and there may be another feature to grandmothers, which is that they enabled you to have two generations of expertise and culture. And it's interesting that the killer whales, the only other species we know of that has postmenopausal females, that has sort of grandmothers who, who are sticking around, is also one of the few animal species that has really distinctive cultural traditions. So there's something about what grandmothers are doing that seems to be contributing to culture. But certainly, grandmothers are helping to keep those babies alive. So again, in a relatively short period, you have these really distinctive adaptations, very different from those of our closest relatives, pair bonding and alloparenting and grandmothering, all designed just to keep these babies al alive in this long period. 
So it seems like this must be serving some function. It must be doing something for us. And in fact, if you look across many, many different species of animals, you see this striking correlation between um, the degree of immaturity of the young and the brain size and, roughly speaking, intelligence, perhaps somewhat anthropomorphic intelligence, but in any case, uh, ability to learn um, uh, on, the part of the, uh, on the part of the adults. And the, the poster birds for this relationship are the poster animals for this relationship aren't even mammals, they're birds. This was where people first noticed this. So for example, this is a New Caledonian crow, and these are crows that live off of uh, 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 New Zealand and uh, in New Caledonia, an island called New Caledonia. Um, and crows and corvids and rooks and ravens in general are incredibly smart animals. Some of you at Cambridge will know the beautiful work that Nikki Clayton, Nicola Clayton has done demonstrating this, even for sort of ordinary everyday crows. These New Caledonian crows are particularly intelligent. So this is a crow that's learned how to uh, bend a wire so that they can, uh, they can get food. Um, and they're intelligent, particularly in the sense that they can learn how to do new things. So they can learn how to do something like take a wire, which they've never seen before, and this problem that they've never seen before, and figure out how to use the wire to solve the problem. In contrast, this is our friend the domestic chicken, and uh, domestic chickens um, and geese and turkeys and other animals in that family are basically as dumb as stumps, um, with apologies to any chicken lovers in the audience. That's, at, at Berkeley, I have to kind of make an apology like that. Oh. Um, or a, maybe a better way of putting it again, not to be too anthropomorphic, is the kind of intelligence that they have is very, very well designed to solve particular problems in one particular um, uh, environmental and ecological niche. So they're extremely good at pecking for grain, and they have complicated computations that are involved in being able to peck for grain, but they're not much good at learning how to do anything else. And in fact, it's interesting that when you look at chicks, they're, the computations they do, which are actually pretty impressive to be able to move around in the world and, and peck for grain, seem to be in place from the time they're born. So newborn chicks are already showing the same kinds of cognitive abilities as the, um, as the adults are, that the adults are showing. Uh, that's in contrast to the uh, crows. So the newborn uh, chickens are mature within a couple of weeks, and the crows are fledglings for as long as a year, and these New Caledonian crows are fledglings for as long as two years, which is a very long time in the life of a bird. And th so there's this very general relationship. Uh, people in biology sometimes talk about it as altricial versus precocial species between this long period of immaturity and the sort of sophistication and intelligence of the adults. Why would that be? Why would you see this relationship? Um, well, when you actually look at the what happens in those two years of life of the immature crows, you can start to get some hints. So uh, in the wild, these amazing birds do things like this. They'll take a pandanus palm branch, so they'll take a palm branch, they'll strip off the leaves from the bottom, which leaves little barbs. They'll nibble the end of it to a sharp point. Then they'll take it with their beaks from the fat end, find a termite, uh, uh, find a tree that has termites in it, uh, stir it up so that the termites get agitated, and then pull out the tool so they get a kind of termite kebab, basically. It's an amazing thing. And even more amazing, I mean, there's lots of complicated kinds of behaviors that are inborn, even more amazing because it seems as if what happens is that the animals are actually learning how to do this. And what's happening in that first two years of immaturity when the animals are fledglings is that they're trying to do this and completely screwing it up. So they're taking the barbs off the top instead of the, off the bottom, and they're trying to get it, hold it with, from the pointy end instead of the the thick blunt end, and they're putting it into holes that don't actually have any termites in them. So essentially what the animals are doing for those first two years is trying to accomplish these skills and failing over and over and over again. And the moms are sort of, I always picture them sort of sitting there and tapping their feet and dropping termites into the baby's mouths as they're doing this. And you see this kind of pattern in lots of other, uh, uh, of these kind of altricial animals. Uh, so essentially what's happening is that 
that period of protected immaturity gives the animals a chance to try and fail and try and fail and try and fail again. And that's a very powerful way of learning. Um, so, you know, as we say down in Silicon Valley, uh, the way that you uh, innovate is by failing fast and failing often. That's one of the keys to innovation. Um, so these crows are failing fast and failing often on the road to innovation, on the road to figuring out how a new environment works. Um, uh, and indeed, the crow brains are also substantially larger than the chicken brains. Uh, so a way I put this sometimes is you could think about babies and young children, or you could think about these immature young as being kind of the research and development division of a species. And then the adults are production and marketing. So they're the ones who are getting to explore some of the broad, uh, some of the broad uh, parameters of the environment they find themselves in, figuring out how that environment works. And then as adults, taking that, taking that exploration and putting it to use to actually get things done. And if that was true, you might expect to see this reflected in uh, the animal's brains. And indeed, you do. Um, certainly, oh, sorry, so I should say, of course, humans are way out on the end of the spectrum on all of these dimensions. So we have by far the biggest brains relative to our bodies. We're the most flexible. We learn best. And we have, as I said before, by far the longest period of immaturity. Um, so you might expect to see this kind of developmental division of labor reflected in brain development. And indeed, so you do. So this is a, a famous chart showing the number of uh, synapses, new neur neuronal connections, uh, over the course of development. And what you can see is that there's this very characteristic sort of tipping point where in the early period, uh, basically up till about age five, so infants and preschoolers, there's many, many, many new synaptic connections, new neuronal connections that are being made. Um, and what happens is there's a kind of tipping point where the connections that are used a lot, that are exercised, get to be stronger and more efficient and more effective. And the ones that don't get pruned. So what happens is the less strong connections disappear. So that when babies, babies and preschoolers actually have 18-month-olds uh, actually have twice as many neural connections as adults do. Uh, now this, so, and as you can see also, this process unfolds differently in different parts of the brain. So if you look at the visual cortex, for instance, which is the orange um, uh, line here, um, by the time babies are about one, their visual system has been pretty much wired up. Um, and taking its adult form, and you start seeing this tipping point, which is part of the reason why you have to do things like treat vision uh, problems very early in babies' lives if the babies are actually going to be able to recover from them. Um, if you look at the auditory cortex, which is the purple uh, line there, you can see that it's about five when, um, when the tipping point happens, which of course is just when children will have finished mastering their first language. And something that we know very well is that children are better at mastering, especially the sound systems of language if they're exposed to a language early on. And as you get older, it gets to be increasingly more difficult to be able to, to, uh, to, be able to, to do that. Uh, interestingly, the latest part of the um, of the brain to mature, and a, a part that's still undergoing a lot of transformation during adolescence is the prefrontal cortex, which is sort of the executive office of the brain. It's the part that's involved in things like long-term planning and inhibition and focus and all the things that we need to do to be a, an effective adult. And very often when you read, especially non-developmentalists thinking about development or thinking about childhood, they tend to think about children as if they were sort of defective adults. So they're adults that are, haven't, haven't got yet gotten the parts that make us be wonderful, smart adults. Um, so you'll hear people talking about how children lack this kind of frontal control, which is true, and that it would be good for them if they had more of it, which might or might not be true. Um, because if you're thinking about this kind of division of labor between an early period of exploration and learning and a later period of effective action, it may very well be that having less of this uh, frontal control is actually 
better for purposes of wide-ranging exploration. And in fact, there's a bunch of interesting work in development in uh, neuroscience that suggests that when even adults are learning, and particularly when they're learning in a creative way, um, they actually deactivate this kind of frontal control. So for example, if you compare musicians who are uh, playing to a score versus improvising, you see deactivation of these frontal control systems when you're improvising. Um, if you disrupt the frontal areas with uh, 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 transcranial stimulation, uh, you see people performing better on uh, divergent thinking tasks, like how many uses can you think of for a Kleenex and so forth. And even if you sort of look moment to moment at brains during learning tasks, you see that at the moment when the brain is learning, you have this kind of release of frontal control. Um, so it may very well be that the lack of frontal control early on, even though it's a disadvantage for these kind of executive control and function uh, uh, functions of the brain, might actually be an advantage for wider and more exploratory kinds of learning. So again, if you're thinking about this kind of R&D versus marketing division, uh, frontal cortex is really good if you're in the executive office. It may not be so good if you're in um, the, the R&D. Uh, department. Um, now, not only do we see this really distinctive difference in brain function uh, across development, so you have this early brain that's, as neuroscientists say, really plastic, flexible, sensitive, able to change with experience, then this later brain that's effective and efficient and operates well and does things well, not so good at changing in the light of experience. Uh, but I want to emphasize again how expensive this is. So this is one of my favorite uh, recent studies. Um, this was a study that, uh, that looked at the amount of calories, the amount of glucose uptake that your brain has at various points in development. So as you may know, when you're an adult, you know, your brain is like a Mac. It's this expensive, fancy computing gadget. And it takes up about 20% of your calories as you're just sitting here right now listening. It always seems to me that if you're thinking deep, important thoughts, it should use more calories, but it doesn't actually seem to work that way. Um, but so what, uh, what Chris Cazola and his colleagues did was to actually track and see what does that look like across development. So what you can see is that um, when children are uh, four years old, 66% of their calories are actually going to their brains. Um, so that's kind of the height of, of calorie use. And it slowly declines as you get older down uh, when you, if you, if you went out to, you know, full professor level, it would be down to that, down to that 20%, uh, it would be down to that 20% point. And there's actually evidence that children's physical growth slows down in the preschool period to accommodate this completely explosive brain growth. I also like this because it seems to be like it's a very good picture of my, um, my five-year-old grandson now, Augie, who is essentially like this creature out of Doctor Who. He's like this giant hungry brain with little arms and legs that goes around the world making us all his slaves and getting us to just feed the brain more and more and more. Um, but from the life history perspective, this is significant because, again, it emphasizes how, how much of an investment um, we have to put into keeping these babies going in this, in this early period. And again, that suggests that this must be doing something significant and important and significantly human um, in this, in this uh, period. So, so what could it be doing? I suggested before that it might looks as if this is involved in learning and particularly exploratory and creative learning. And if that story is correct, then we might expect to see some distinctive learning capacities as well as brain capacities going on in this early period when all of this plasticity is, is taking place. And that's where the research that I and my colleagues have done over the last uh, 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 30 years, God, yeah, I guess over the last 30 years, kicks in. Um, and in particular, over the last 15 years or so, um, we've been looking at um, the way that even very young children uh, can learn in a way that's very similar to the ways that scientists learn. Um, my first book was called The Scientist in the Crib. And for a long time, I've been arguing for 
something that people call the theory theory, the idea that children's cognitive development is analogous to theory change and theory formation in science. And for some period of time, that was just sort of a metaphor. But over the last 15 years, what we've started to do is actually give computational accounts of what it is that would be going on in a mind, whether it's a scientist's or a baby's or a computer's, that would enable it to learn, would enable it to learn, and particularly to learn in a powerful way about a new environment. And at least one such uh, learning capacity is the ability to learn about causal models, learn about generative theories of the world from uh, statistical data. And what we've shown is that we can give a formal account of how that kind of learning is possible. Um, and philosophers of science and people in computer science have done this. This has been one of the, the discoveries that's led to the rebirth, the new spring of, of AI um, and machine learning. Um, and in particular, that we can use methods of Bayesian inference to learn those generative models from patterns of data. And I just have a couple of references up there sort of summarizing this work. Um, and what we've discovered is that even three-year-olds, four-year-olds, even as young as 18 months, um, and maybe even younger, we can show that children are at least unconsciously um, acting in a way that looks that is in accord with these kinds of learning mechanisms. And the way we do this is we can give them patterns of evidence and see what kinds of conclusions they draw. And I'm going to give you some examples of this. And what's happened just very recently in the past couple of years, and happened somewhat seren serendipitously, was that we discovered that not only were children good at this kind of learning, but they, in some circumstances, were actually better at it than um, Old, young children were actually better at it than older children and adults were. Um, so I'm going to tell you uh, some more about this, uh, this research now. And this is research with uh, Chris Lucas, who's now actually near here, at, or near here by American standards anyway, at the University of Edinburgh. Um, uh, so we started out wanting to know whether children could infer abstract causal principles. So we'd already shown over the last 15 years that children were very good at inferring specific relationships between specific causes and specific effects. But could children infer a more abstract logical principle, the sort of thing that you know, uh, Thomas Kuhn talked about as a paradigm or a framework principle, an abstract, an overhypothesis, an abstract principle that constrains the specific causal inferences that you make? Um, now, how could we actually test that? Well, the way that we've done all this work is with these very, very simple toy-like devices. This is one of them. This is the Blicket Detector. And the Blicket Detector is a box that lights up and plays music when you put some things on it and not other things. And with this very simple device, what we can do is show children and adults and other people patterns of evidence about the relationship between the blocks and the activation of the machine. And then we can say things, as you'll see in a minute, like, well, OK, is this one a blicket or not? Or we can say, make the machine go, which enables us to tell what kind of causal inferences the children have made about how the machine works. So you know, as you probably know, my uh, colleague, uh, Danny Kahneman, actually got the Nobel Prize for pointing out that um, even adults are terrible at doing this kind of probabilistic inference. If you phrase it to them in terms of probability, they make terrible mistakes. But fortunately, we're not, we weren't even tempted to go to the four-year-olds and say, how probable do you think this is? Or you know, how do you, what kind of conclusions do you think you should draw from this pattern of conditional probability? Um, what we did was just get them to see things and act on them. And just Parenthetically, that's been the reason why we've had this tremendous revolution in our understanding of babies and young children over the past 30 years, was figuring out methods like this. Uh, uh, so giving them you know, a real situation with real objects and real causal uh, uh, relationships has enabled us to show just how much they know. Now, I should add, by the way, the truth is that all of this is being done by the graduate student pushing a button um, behind a curtain behind the blicky detector. But fortunately, none of our participants, children or adults, ever seem to figure that out. Um, my son, who was a pilot uh, subject in these experiments, was very indignant when two years later I explained to him that it was 
that was really a story of the matrix that was going on. Um, okay, so you can all be participants in this one of these experiments to show you how, how it works. So this was an experiment we were doing to, to, uh, to try and figure out what kinds of causal inferences children would make. Um, and we showed them three different kinds of blocks. Um, you'll see in a minute they're different shapes, but for now we'll just call them D, E, and F. Um, and D goes on the detector three times and nothing happens. E goes on the detector once and nothing happens. D and F in combination go on the detector twice and both times the detector lights up and plays music. So now the question we want to ask is simple. We tell the kids that uh, blicketness makes the machine go. And your job is to say, is D a blicket? No. Okay. <laughs> Rune is willing to commit to. Is E a blicket? No. No. Okay. Everyone agrees about E. Is F a blicket? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So, as I would have expected, even though it's Cambridge instead of Oxford, um, the people here are as smart as Berkeley undergraduates are, but possibly not as smart as four year olds. Because what if you also saw this sequence of events? So but what you saw now is you saw that A, B, and C go on the detector. Uh, a and B don't make it go. A and C do, and B and C don't. And B and C don't, but A and C together do. You might think, oh, wait a minute. This detector doesn't work the way that I thought that it worked. I thought that it worked by e that either something led to the cause or it didn't lead to the cause. So either a block was a blicket, and then if it was a blicket, it made it go, or if it wasn't a blicket, it didn't make it go. Um, and if I thought that, then I could use a kind of inference that the great philosopher of science, uh, Hans Reichenbach, described as screening off. I could uh, use that to figure out that only F was a blicket in the previous, um, in the previous slide. But if the machine works in this unusual way, in this unlikely way, if it works on this other logical principle, an and conjunctive principle, so that you have to have two, um, two blickets to make the machine go, it has to be the combination rather than the individual objects that lead to the effect, then I might go back to that ambiguous sequence that I saw before and reinterpret it. So if I've seen that the machine works on this conjunctive principle, I might say, even though that's kind of an unusual way for a machine to work, now I look at this sequence and I'd say, oh no, wait a minute, maybe if the machine works on that conjunctive principle, then D and F are both blickets, because D and F together are the ones on the machine that are making the machine go. Okay, everybody got that? So what we did was, we just did exactly that experiment that I just did with you, um, with um, uh, Berkeley undergraduates it, to begin with in our first study with Berkeley undergraduates and four-year-olds. Um, and we either gave them evidence for this conjunctive relationship, um, which I mentioned, the, the one that says that the machine works in this unusual way, or we gave them evidence that the machine works in the way that's the sort of obvious way that you would predict that it would work in the disjunctive way. So there's the disjunctive sequence at the beginning and then the, the conjunctive one. Um, and by the way, there's whole theories of causal inference in adults in cognitive psychology that just assume that this disjunctive form is the form that we use when we're taking, when we're making causal inferences. So there's a lot of evidence that that's kind of our default assumption as adults about how, how causality works. Um, and then we gave them, uh, so we did that with, with uh, a different set of blocks, and then we actually tested them uh, in exactly the way that I just showed you. Um, it, in the first experiment, we used the sequence I just showed you. In the second experiment, which is what I'm going to talk about, um, we used a slightly different, but it's a similar, a similar idea. We added in a, a <coughs> trial with all three objects. That was because of goddamn reviewer two. Um, but let me show you what this looks like. It's very important, again, for us to figure out which of these are blickets. So let's call this one triangle, OK? What should we call this one? Square. Square. And what should we call this one? Ball. Ball. Sounds good. OK, so let's see what happens when we put triangle on the machine. Are you ready? Let's see. Look at that. The machine did not turn on. Let's see what happens when we put triangle on the machine again, OK? Look, the machine did not turn on. Now let's see what happens when we put triangle on the machine one more time, OK? Let's see. Look, the machine did not turn on. Now let's see what happens when we put square on the machine, okay? 
Look at that. The machine did not turn on. Okay, now let's see what happens when we put triangle and ball on the machine together. Look at that. The machine turned on. Now let's see what happens when we put triangle, square, and ball all on the machine together. Are you ready? Let's see. Look at that. The machine turned on. Okay. Now let's see what happens when we put triangle and ball on the machine together. Are you ready? Let's see. Look. The machine turned on. So Scarlett, do you think that triangle is a blicket or not a blicket? A blicket. And do you think that square is a blicket or not a blicket? No. No. And do you think that ball is a blicket or not a blicket? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Scarlett, which of these should we use to make my machine turn on? Those two? Okay, so those of you who went to the um, Philosophy of Science talk will recognize the uh, incredibly adorable Sophie, who's my research assistant, who's now a high-powered graduate student at Stanford. Um, but I like to show this, this film partly because it's a moral obligation of developmental psychologists to show cute ch children films, but also because if you're like, um, if you're like, like most people, this is kind of a little bit like the, uh, um, the humiliation game that, uh, um, if, if some of you, no, come on, get the word. If some of you know the novel about the humiliation game, this is a bit like this in the sense that you may very well be sitting there and thinking to yourself, am I the only person who has no idea what was going on in that film? Was it, did everybody else get it? I can't remember, it was like the ball was on and then the other one was on and then I think the square one was on. Um, um, Having seen this many times, I still get confused about it. You can see that Sophie, my research assistants, have to sit and read from a script to make sure that they, uh, they do it right. But the, this four-year-old little girl is paying attention, and she was in the conjunctive training condition. You didn't see the training in the first place. And she gets it right. So she says that uh, D and F are blickets, E isn't, um, and that you should put them both on to make the machine go. So what we did was, as I said, is we did this systematically first with uh, children and adults. And first we looked at what happened in the disjunctive training when we gave them the training that suggested the obvious hypothesis. And both children and adults in that case say that F is a blicket and D is not, which is the rational thing that they, they should do. So it's kind of impressive that four-year-olds are able to do this kind of screening off anyway. Um, but they're doing it about the same, to the, about the same extent as adults. But then the interesting thing happened when we gave them the unusual structure, the conjunctive structure. And what you can see is that in this case, the children are normatively, appropriately saying that D and F are blickets. And in fact, it, they are less likely to say that E is a blicket, which is also normative in this uh, circumstance. But the adults aren't. So the adults are producing the same pattern of results that they did in the disjunctive case. So they're saying that F is a blicket and D isn't, and that you did when I was showing it to you to begin with. So even when the adults are getting evidence that suggests this unlikely overhypothesis, this unlikely general principle about how the machine works, they still uh, assume the obvious principle when they're actually trying to make the judgment. Yeah? Did anyone say that they did not have enough information to actually well, we did, the, we did a version of this experiment where we actually got people to do probability ratings. We couldn't do this with the kids, but we did it with the adults where we said, you know, on a scale of one to five, how likely is it that you think that this is a, a blicket? And we got exactly the same pattern of results. Um, uh, and uh, I uh, haven't shown this here, but um, when we looked at, we also looked at, you know, was it just something about the word blicket that children and adults were interpreting differently? So we did the same analysis, looking at whether um, the children and the adults actually put multiple objects on the machine or just put the F object on the machine. So even if, you know, you have a different interpretation of blicket, if you really think the, call the machine's causal structure is that you need multiple objects to make it go, then you should put multiple objects on, as that little girl did. But if you think it's following the disjunctive principle, then you should just put the F object on. And we find exactly the same pattern. The adults are acting as if they're assuming the disjunctive principle. So they're just putting on F, even when they've had evidence in support of this un unlikely principle. 
Um, now, one question you might ask is, is this just something uh, about privileged Berkeley uh, kids. We've tested a lot of these kids actually in science museums, so maybe it's something about children that, who are children of Berkeley professors and who are in, uh, in a, visiting a science museum, or is this something more general about um, four-year-olds in general? Um, and we also wanted to ask whether how this would unfold across development. So, and these are again are the graduate students who, of course, do all the actual work. Um, so, is causal learning weird as uh, as people in psychology? say, is it just restricted to those weird Western, educated, industrial, rich, developed countries? Um, so the first thing that we did was we actually looked at children in Oakland Head Start programs. I don't know if you know Head Start in America is a program for uh, very low-income children to get uh, preschool uh, support. Um, and in fact, as other studies have shown, the children had significantly lower IQ and executive function scores than the non-Head Start children, the children in the preschools. But when we actually looked at their causal inference, it was actually very similar to the children in the preschools. So you can see that uh, the, um, uh, the Head Start children are also differentiating between D, depending on whether it's conjunctive or disjunctive. They're saying D and F are both plicates in the conjunctive condition, and that D is uh, that D is not obligate in the disjunctive condition in pretty much the same way that the non-Head Start children are. Um, we also wanted to see, would this be true for an even more uh, different population? So we actually looked in Peru, um, and we looked at a, a chain of schools, the Innova schools, that are designed to uh, serve what's people called the emerging middle class in Peru. And what the, the, these people really are, are people who are first or second generation immigrants from the Andes or the Amazon, and they come to Peru and they build uh, shanty towns on the edges of Lima. So they'll sort of come in and, and you, as if you go out to the suburbs of Lima, you see all of these built structures with rebar sort of sticking out on the top for the next community to come in from the village. Um, um, and these are, uh, very poor families from the perspective of just income, so their monthly income is about $1,200 a month, um, and they're usually coming from, you know, as I say, they're, they're first generation immigrants, so the grandmothers are often not literate, and some of them don't speak Spanish, they speak uh, various kinds of indigenous languages. But these are children whose parents are very ambitious for them, um, that's part of this phenomenon of the emerging middle class in Peru, um, and they're willing to spend a quarter of their budget on sending the children to these schools so that the children can, can get a reasonable education. So these are children who are growing up in very different circumstances from the children um, in Berkeley. But they're children who have a lot of parental investment and support nonetheless. Um, and we wanted to see what these children look like. And we also wanted to see how they, they would compare with uh, Peruvian adults. So we looked at undergraduates at a school nearby the uh, the communities that we were looking at. And we discovered that the Peruvian children, if anything, were better at solving these problems than the Berkeley preschoolers were. Um, and in fact, they were definitely better than the Head Start children were. Um, and the Peruvian adults looked exactly like the uh, US adults. So the, just like the US adults, the Peruvian adults were sticking to the obvious conclusion, and just like the uh, the U.S. kids, the Peruvian children were discriminating between the, uh, between the two conditions. Um, um, so it looks as if this capacity to make these inferences and to make these kind of broad inferences at least isn't something that's just restricted to a narrow range of children and adults. Um, but the next question that we wanted to ask was how does this how does this ability change across development? So um, again, thinking from this life history perspective, we have some evidence that children are looking different from adults, but of course there's lots of differences between children and adults. What's actually happening to turn the four-year-olds into the adults? Um, and there were two hypotheses that we were considering in particular. Um, if you think about this phenomenon in Bayesian terms, an obvious thought that you should have, and probably you already have had, is, well, look, as you get more and more experience of the world, it makes sense for you to require more and more evidence to overturn your assumptions. So as I go out in the world and I see that causality usually has this kind of disjunctive form, that most machines work that way, 
it's right and proper that it should take more to convince me that I'm wrong than when I'm just starting out and I don't have very strong reasons for thinking one thing rather than another. So from a, a Bayesian perspective, you'd say that you're starting out with a flatter prior and then your prior is becoming more peaked as you get older and as your prior becomes more peaked, you should be relying more on the prior and less on the new evidence. That would actually be the normative thing to do. So one thing that might be going on here is that children are just gradually acquiring more and more evidence for the likely hypotheses and therefore are less likely to override it. That would still be interesting and it would still be an important developmental pattern and it would still be connected to this life history. Um, and, and in fact, as you'll see, I think this is actually part of the story. But it could also be, think back to that, um, think back to that graph that I showed you about the brain, it could also be that there are discontinuities in this development. So if you look at the brain, it's not just that there's a single process that's unfolding over time, it looks like there's these points, these tipping points where things really change. And one of these discontinuities is around the school age period. So if you think back to that brain slide, it's about five that you start to see the curves going in the opposite direction. Um, and we have lots of other reasons for thinking that that's a big developmental transition. The reason why those are school age children is because things are happening to those children that make it appropriate for them to go to school. Um, and another time when we know that there's a developmental transition, as I mentioned before, is in adolescence, when we know that there's, again, this kind of rebirth, this big extra burst of, of plasticity and, uh, and brain change in adolescence. Uh, and again, just you know, anecdotally and also in development, we know that that's an important developmental transition. So what we decided to do was to take these experiments and then look at how they developed across the whole lifespan from the preschoolers up to the adults. And so we just took the experiment that we just did with you and uh, did it with um, uh, children ranging from, the first this is the data that you just saw, this is the four-year-olds versus the adults, and this is how likely are they to say that D is obligate in the combination uh, condition. Um, and when you look at the school-age children, the six to seven-year-olds and the nine to 11-year-olds, they are looking more like the adults than the preschoolers are. So they're significantly less likely to say that D is obligate in the conjunctive condition. Um, although if you look in, by the way, in the disjunctive condition, there's no age differences at all. Everybody just looks the same. Um, uh, but interestingly, but in that you know five years between six and 11, there doesn't seem to be any additional change happening. The six-year-olds and the, and the 11-year-olds are looking pretty similar. But if we look at the adolescents, they look much more like the adults. And in fact, the adolescents and adults aren't significantly different, and they're both significantly different from the school-age children and the um, four-year-olds. Um, so in this case, it looks as if what happens is there's a big shift in adolescence, and then it pretty much kind of remains constant as you're going into adulthood. And you can say the, see the same thing if instead of looking at the judgments about D. Now, if you look at the intervention choices, which I mentioned uh, earlier, so this is do you use multiple items to make the machine go or just a single item? And as I mentioned, you can see that the adults are significantly less likely to use multiple items than the four-year-olds. And again, the school-age children are pretty similar to one another and not as good as the four-year-olds. Um, and then the adolescents are really different and look more like the adults. So it looks as if in this kind of physical causal task, there's a uh, not just a gradual change, but there's these developmental transitions at school age and at, in um, adolescence. Okay, but everything I've been talking about so far, this blicky detector tasks are all about physical causation. And one of the things we know, again, especially from an um, uh, evolutionary perspective, is that um, social and psychological causation is also particularly important for, uh, it, particularly important for human beings. Um, again, this is the theory of mind work, as I mentioned, that we did a long time ago. So we wanted to see what would happen if you were talking about a social situation rather than a physical one. Would you see the same, uh, the same thing happen? Suppose you're inferring a, a broad causal schema about people rather than about objects. And to do this, we went back to a phenomenon that's been known in the social psychology literature. It's one of the most well-studied phenomena in social psychology for a very long time, since the 60s. And this is about whether you explain somebody's behavior in terms of their long-lasting individual personality traits or in terms of the situations in which they find themselves. And again, going back to the 50s and 60s, people discovered that at least Western adults have what's called the 
a fundamental attribution error or a trait bias, which means that they tend to overinterpret people's behavior in terms of these long-lasting individual personality traits. And the classic experiment about this, and this gives you a sense of how old this uh, research is, you take uh, a room like this and the experimenter would tell half the people on this side of the room to read and write an essay supporting Castro and get up and read it. And these people on the other side of the room read and write an essay opposing Castro. And then at the end of the exercise, you ask everyone in the room to rate how left wing or right wing you think the other people in the room are. And believe it or not, people say that the people who wrote the essay supporting Castro are more left wing than the people who wrote the essay opposing it, even though they know, they've just seen that the reason why the people wrote those essays was because somebody told them to write the essays. Um, and this is a, a very, as I say, this is a very general, well-studied phenomenon in social psychology. Um, so we wanted to see something about the origin of this uh, tendency to ignore evidence when you're um, thinking about a, a social situation. So what we did was we showed, again, this time four-year-olds and six-year-olds, a kind of uh, social blicka detector task. And the way we did it was we had two little dolls, Sally and Josie, and two little toys, a skateboard and a scooter. Um, and we showed the children different patterns of covariation between um, the dolls and the toys and a particular action pattern. So for example, children would see that Josie goes on the skateboard and plays on the skateboard. Um, and we'd say, see, she's playing on the skateboard. And then they'd see that Sally gets near the skateboard, but then gets scared and backs away. She doesn't want to play on the skateboard. Um, and then they see the scooter, and they see that Josie goes and plays on the scooter happily, and Sally uh, moves away from the, uh, from the skateboard. And they actually see a probabilistic, in this experiment, they actually saw a probabilistic pattern of covariation between the the uh, dolls and the toys and the action. So for example, in this condition, um, this, if you were being a good causal inference engine, you should conclude that it's something about the person. It's something about Josie that's leading to the action pattern um, and something about Sally that's leading her not to uh, play on the, on the toys. Uh, so this supports a kind of trait-like inference. But of course, you could just have almost exactly the same sequence of events uh, the same dolls, the same toys, um, but now the covariation pattern is different. So in the second, uh, uh, in the second case, what we did was we showed children that both of the, both Josie and Sally play happily on the skateboard, uh, but they refuse to play. So they, they, sorry, they, um, they play on the, they refuse to play on the scooter, but they happily play on the skateboard. Um, and in that case, if you were being a good causal inference engine, you should conclude that it's something about the situation, something about the toys that's leading to the pattern of action. And then we had a control condition where the children just see Sally on the skateboard and Josie on the, and the scooter. And if you're being a good scientist, this is confounded data. You shouldn't conclude anything about what the causal structure is all about. Um, and then we simply asked the children uh, to explain why Sally played on the skateboard and why Josie didn't play, uh, why, why Sally didn't play on the scooter and why Josie did play on the scooter. So we just took the last two actions of the two toys and we just said, explain why did they do that? And it turns out that the explanations that the children gave, gave could be categorized into these different, um, in, into these different categories. Now, interestingly, the four-year-olds rarely gave kind of classic trait explanations, like she's scared or she's, uh, uh, sorry, she's brave or she's cowardly. But they did give internal explanations that have a kind of trait-like structure. One of my favorites was they often said, she's the big sister, Josie's the big sister, and Sally's the little sister. Um, uh, and a big sister is interesting because it's got the same kind of causal structure as a, uh, as a trait, as being brave or being cowardly. Um, or she knows how to ride the skateboard. She doesn't know how to ride the skateboard. Um, but they also gave external explanations, like the scooter's fun or the skateboard's wobbly. So what we what we measured was how often do um, how often did the did the children um, give situation or trait explanations in the two different conditions when those were supported by the data. Um, and then what we did was we went ahead and said, and what we found was that the four-year-olds were actually being good scientists. So the four-year-olds would um, so let me let me show you the data. 
So the first thing that we found was here's the four-year-olds. We found that the four-year-olds would give person, so this is the, the top line is the percentage of situation explanations that children are giving. And, um, so what we found was that, and the three lines are the, the top is the situation condition where the evidence supports the situation inference, then the baseline, the control condition where it doesn't support any kind of inference, and then finally the case where it supports the person uh, inference. So the first thing that we found was that the four-year-olds were being good scientists. When they it was confounded, they were 50-50. If the covariation supported a situation inference, they gave a situation explanation. And if it supported a person inference, they gave a person explanation. Um, on the other hand, when we looked at the six-year-olds, the six-year-olds were already showing a bias. So the six-year-olds were already more likely to give internal explanations, even when the data supported um, a a, a situation explanation. They weren't completely insensitive to the data. They were paying attention to the data. But they showed the same trait bias that the literature suggested we saw in adults. So then what we did was we actually did it in adults on MTER to make sure that this was true. And sure enough, the adults looked like the six-year-olds and like the adults in all of the social psychology experiments. But then we decided to see what happens to this kind of inference across the school age period and across adolescence. And we discovered something really striking. This is the baseline. This is when you don't have any data. And you could see, so first of all, you can see that when the data supports a person explanation, everybody gives a person trait explanation. Um, in the baseline, when you don't have any data, the adolescents are still very likely to give a trait explanation. So that seems to be like their default condition, that obvious explanation. But when they get data that goes against that explanation, they're more likely than any other age group to change their minds, to consider the alternative uh, hypothesis. So in this social setting, as opposed to being less flexible, um, the adolescents are actually being more flexible. And that actually fits with a lot of other um, data about adolescents, both if you look at, um, I mentioned that there's evidence for these, uh, this newfound plasticity in uh, adult brain development. But the places, the areas where you see that plasticity are in areas of the brain that are involved in social cognition and social learning. Um, and if you think about it, adolescents very often are sort of at the leading edge of various kinds of social, uh, various kinds of social change. So essentially, the adolescents seem to have sort of decided, OK, I understand how the physical world works. I don't have to think about that anymore. I'm just going to stick with my priors when it comes to the physical world. But uh, in the social world, I'm actually going to pay attention to the evidence and be willing to change my mind based on the evidence. And again, this pattern in particular suggests that what's going on isn't just accumulated experience. Presumably, the adolescents have accumulated lots of experience of the trait uh, explanation, as evidenced in their um, baseline behavior. Um, but that there might be something that's really going on in these developmental transitions at school. And notice also that uh, in this case, there's, um, there's the, the difference with school age is going in the opposite direction. So it, this, in particular, I think, supports the idea that there's something going on in these developmental transitions at, the school age, at school age and at um, adolescence. OK. Um, so, uh, so can we give a computational account of these developmental differences? So why are we seeing these developmental uh, differences. What would be a good kind of computational story? Why would we be seeing these changes in flexibility across human uh, life history? And the account that we've given of this um, depends on a whole other idea. Again, I talked about this at the philosophy of science uh, group yesterday. Um, and this has to do with a whole other problem, which is if children are learning in this kind of Bayesian way where they look at hypotheses and then look at the evidence and then try and decide how likely the hypothesis is given the evidence. There's a catch to that kind of learning. It's a very powerful kind of learning. But the catch is that for realistic problems, there's this very, very large hypothesis space, very large number of possible hypotheses compatible with any uh, piece of data. Um, and the question is, how do you figure out, how do you search through that hypothesis? hypothesis space, as computer scientists say, how do you decide which hypotheses to test? And in computer science, in machine learning, the way that they solve this problem is through what are called sampling or Monte Carlo methods. And basically what happens is that you pick out methods, uh, you pick out hypotheses partly at random to try, but you're systematic about it. It's not just completely random. So you'll pick out some hypotheses rather than others. 
And in this literature in particular, there's a contrast between two different ways that you can do this kind of sampling. So think about, think about trying to find a, an answer to a problem, say, get a pattern of evidence, and you want to explain what brought about that evidence, what caused that evidence. You can think about it as if here's a big box full of potential hypotheses, and you're right here at this space in the, in the box. That's where you are now. One thing that you could do is you could just make small shifts to the hypothesis that you already have. So you could just make sort of small alterations. And you could be pretty conservative. You could, you could feel as if you wanted to stay pretty close to where you, where you already were. And it would take quite a lot of evidence to shift you from your current position. Um, and when you do get shifted, you just shift to some place that's pretty close to where you already are. That's actually a very good strategy. People in, in, in computer science and machine learning call this a low temperature search. The analogy is think of that box as if it was a box full of air molecules and you're a little air molecule moving around in the box. Um, that kind of low temperature search means that you're likely to get a good enough answer pretty quickly. So you're likely to get an answer that's OK pretty fast, um, an answer that you can act on pretty fast. But there might be another solution, another answer, that's more different from where you are now, that's further away in the space. Especially, remember, we're thinking about these kind of big framework paradigm theories. So there might be, maybe if you just shift your whole set of assumptions about it, if you, uh, you can't quite get out of the box in this case, but you go a lot further away in the box. You really change your framework baseline assumptions about how this system works. Um, there might actually be a much better solution. You know, there might be quantum mechanics or Einsteinian physics sitting over far away in another corner of the, the box. Um, and if you just do the low temperature search, you are likely to kind of get stuck in a local minimum and never get to this uh, better solution. On the other hand, you can also do uh, what people in machine learning call a high temperature search, um, where instead of just looking locally, you could bounce around the space. Just a little bit of evidence, you could go to far off parts of the space. Or to put it another way, you could try out hypotheses that are really, really different from where you currently are. And in particular, you could try out hypotheses that have different logical assumptions than where you, re you currently are. So you, like you might think, well, I don't know, maybe this machine works with a conjunctive principle instead of a disjunctive principle. Or maybe these people are acting because of the situation they're in instead of the traits that they have. Um, and that has the advantage that um, you are likely to find this low probability answer that's far away in this space. It has the disadvantage that you're going to spend a lot of time considering possibilities that are completely irrelevant and not helpful and really different from where you already are. So that high temperature strategy is not a good strategy if you have to make decisions quickly, if you actually have to implement something and do decision making. But it is a good strategy if you want to explore the space as widely as possible and learn as much as possible. And in uh, computer science, so there's this very basic tension, this tension that just sort of pervades all of cognition, which is this tension between exploitation and exploration. So the things that you need to do to be able to make decisions, act swiftly, be effective in the world, the kind of cognitive capacities that you need to do that are really different and seem to be in a kind of intrinsic tension, intrinsic trade-off with the kind of abilities that you need to be able to explore a space very widely, to learn a lot of new things, to find out things that are new about your environment. And in uh, computer learning, um, the way that they solve this problem, or at least one way of solving this problem, is through a process called sim simulated annealing. So the idea is the same way that uh, heating up a metal makes it more and cooling it down makes it more robust. It turns out that if you start out with this very bouncy, broad, high temperature search, it sort of gives you the big, broad parameters of, of the problem space, um, and then cool down and do the local search to figure out the details, you're most likely to actually end up getting an optimal solution. And these kind of annealing techniques are sort of the secret for being able to solve these big multi-dimensional, high-dimensional search problems in something like machine learning. So last, I guess next to last slide. Um, so our hypothesis is that childhood is basically evolution's way of performing simulated annealing. So childhood gives you this period where you can explore this problem space the way that the crows are exploring the potential of the, of the um, of the palm leaves um, without actually having to worry about decision making, without actually having to worry about effectively acting in the environment. 
And if you think about it, if you're in a situation in which envirom your environment is likely to be somewhat different from the preceding generation's environment, this kind of a strategy is going to be particularly important. And that, of course, is exactly the niche that human beings find themselves in. So the very fact that we can do things like have cultural evolution means that every generation is facing a slightly different environment, if only because the previous generation modified the environment that they found themselves. Um, and if you're in that situation where you're facing every time, every generation is facing a somewhat different environment, then having this long protected period when you can just work out what the general causal um, uh, uh, parameters of the environment are before you actually have to go out and do decision making is a really turns out even you know formally computationally to be a really uh, effective strategy. So if you want um, and and that seems to be sort of nature's way of solving this explore exploit uh, explore exploit tension. Um, now just a last thing to say so. That suggests that if you wanted, for instance, to have a form of intelligence that was like human intelligence, it couldn't be just a single form of intelligence. You wouldn't want to have creatures that just always did the same thing. What you'd want to have is you'd want to have creatures that had this kind of division between our computations, that had this kind of division and had this developmental division between periods in which you are solving problems in one kind of way and then periods in which you're solving the problem in, uh, an, in another kind of way. Uh, let me put up my... Uh, collaborators and support on this, but last thing to say is, so um, I mentioned that the way that this problem gets solved is through this kind of random walk uh, uh, Monte Carlo methods in computation, um, but it's still, I mean, even if you use those methods, it still turns out to be an incredibly hairy problem to solve. So as soon as you get into a space that's wider than, you know, chess or or Atari games, those are pretty narrowly defined spaces, um, it gets to be very, very hard to solve these problems, even with these sampling methods. And the thing that children seem to be able to do is to think up hypotheses that are very different from where they currently are and from the hypotheses the previous generation has, but are still sort of plausible, that are still likely candidates, that aren't just complete random nonsense. And that's the thing that um, that we don't have a good, even really a clue about doing computationally in artificial intelligence. That's something every four-year-old can do, is think, okay, this is a weird idea, but kind of makes sense. It's kind of a plausible idea. Um, and that's something that we don't even have a good, we're not even, we don't even have a good handle on, potential handle on in artificial intelligence. So if we want the to have artificial intelligence that looks like human intelligence, it will have to look a lot more like what four-year-olds can do. And let me stop there and take some questions. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, I'm Keith Price. I'm the academic director of CFI. And we now have um, 20 minutes or so for questions. Um, if, I'll, I'll, if people have questions, I'll try and keep a, a, a cue, so signal to me with a hand would like to ask a question. Um, yes. So uh, thank you, Alison, for this talk. It was great. One of the things I was thinking a lot about is how children have to adjust to sometimes changes in an educational system. So one of the things that primary school, mm -hmm. primary school teachers um, have said to me a lot recently is that student, their students who are in five to 11 are showing a large increase in being unwilling to fail. They're unwilling to try and yeah. step out. And, and they're really quite concerned about this. And I was thinking about that in relation to what you were talking about in terms of that being willing to try out stuff that may even have li little payback. Yeah. It's really an important part of childhood. And I wanted to get a sense of if you thought about how that could how some of the changes could be driven by schooling as yeah. well, in terms of some of the decline that, you, that you're seeing. Yeah, in school exactly. And is kind of due to what's going on in schools. Yeah, so it's a really interesting question about you know, when you see these developmental transitions like school age or adolescence, um, 
how much of that, I mean, there is, we know that there's some biological changes that are taking place, obviously, like puberty and adolescence. But of course, we're also putting people in completely different environments, and the things that are important become different, and the environments that they're in become different. And I think there's no question that there's some interaction that's going on between those changes in the environment and the, and the internal sort of biological changes. And it seems very plausible that in the case of school age transition, you'd see this school difference making a making a big difference. And I think it would be very interesting, we've actually thought about doing this, you know, going out and doing something like doing these things in a place like Finland, where, you know, it's not till seven that you start seeing the transition to adult school, whether we'd see the kids looking more like, uh, uh, like the younger, like the younger kids. One thing I should say is at Berkeley, we have, we had a whole research program that I thought was going to be really cool for how could we get the undergraduates to look more like the preschoolers. We gave them creativity tests and we, we zapped their frontal lobes and we, you know, tried to cut down on the, the sense of whether they felt as if they were under pressure to solve the tasks. None of it made any difference. By the time they're Berkeley undergraduates, there's so much, is this going to be on the test that it just nothing seems to, this <laughs> depressing thought is that nothing seems to overcome that. But I still think that there are things that we could do that would make adults even behave that way. And I think if you, it, but an interesting thought is that if you think about this explore exploit trade off, it may be that some of the obvious things you would do, think of, like rewarding people for getting the right answer, which seems like an incentive for them to learn, if this is right, that might actually be a disincentive in the sense that it would lead you to go for that, the quick, um, more likely option rather than trying, risking the unlikely option. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Alison, I was interested in a comment you made right at the end, if I understood it correctly, about the distinctive capacities of human children being uh, an adaptation for the fact that our environments might be different to those of the parents because of the impact that we as humans have yeah. on the environment. And uh, it seems that humans pre Homo sapiens had very stable cultures for very long periods, so that might not have been such a significant factor. I wonder if you have a view on whether this is distinctive to Homo sapiens, or sort of paleoanthropology plays a role in your thinking. Yeah, well, I have a slide which I didn't put in and for, for, uh, for purposes of time. You know, it's very hard to answer these questions, but there's at least one hypothesis, which is that there was a lot more climate variability going on in the period of, of human evolution. So that's sort of, so, so you, know, you might say, okay, well, once this got stuck, gets started, you can see how it happens, but what was the sort of exogenous, um, uh, uh, what was the exogenous stimulus that led to this process starting in the first place? And at least one plausible hypothesis is that, um, I have the slide here, uh, is that you know, when you look at a slide of how much the climate is changing, it's relatively constant over until you get to uh, you know, sort of beginnings of, of Homo erectus, and then it gets much, much less predictable during the time that you see the changes from early hominids to to Homo sapiens. So it may be that, you know, sort of naturally you had to deal with this variability to begin with, and that was the key, that was the trigger for the changes. But then once you started having the changes and you started having culture, then you'd get these kind of rapid co-evolutionary processes that would mean that now you were changing. So you might have started out changing your environment to deal with the circumstances. And I think this is also relevant to the, you know, behaviorally modern versus anatomically modern human uh, question. So part of what might have been happening is that as you got more resources, and I think this is true in our culture, for example, even if, even, you know, biologically children are going to be dependent, human children are dependent for much longer, but it's also true that in some cultural circumstances we can afford to have them be dependent up till the time they're 28, um, and that might be part of what's happening. Well, thank you. Um, so I'm wondering whether, so one of the things you showed were these differences in and I'm wondering if you um, look, try to get at the reasons why the behavior is happening. Mm -hmm. So I guess there are various ways one could do that. One would be um, by asking the subjects in terms of self-reports. Um, right. What explanations do they give? Um, so you can imagine some use evidence, some say it just feels right, uh, or maybe neural mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Whether there are different neural mechanisms underpinning the child's strategy. And the adult strategy. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, as I say, I mean, there's a little, we, we did try this using TDCS to disrupt frontal activity and seeing if it would make the adults look more like the children. That was the hypothesis. And it kind of sort of worked, but TDCS is very squirrely and it's, you know, hard to 
get it was hard to be sure that we were actually disrupting what we thought we were disrupting and so forth. So in principle, I think we should be able to to do that. So I, in principle, I think we would see some of these same kinds of uh, we would see some of these same kind of changes. Just a methodological point to make is the reason why we did the uh, the disjunctive and the conjunctive condition, even though it meant we had to test twice as many kids, is that automatically gives you a control for some things that you think might be different between children and adults. So, for example, you might think, okay, the adults are paying more attention, are paying less attention than the children, or the adults are have different memory than the children do, or the adults are motivated differently. But remember, the difference between that conjunctive and disjunctive case is tiny, right? I mean, it's exactly the same events. That it's exactly the same person. They're putting the blocks on in the same order. Sometimes they're lighting up. Sometimes they're not. The only difference is what the covariation is between the lighting and the putting the blocks on. So that means that if you're seeing the adults and children looking the same in the disjunctive case, but different in the conjunctive case, it's not, it means it's not because of these kind of broader information processing or other kinds of, of differences. It has to be something about that covariation that's actually the thing that's, that's making the difference in the developmental, uh, in the developmental pattern. So, so that's kind of, you know, way of do, of controlling for some of those things, answering some of that question, uh, here. But I think it is an, also an interesting question about how explicit or implicit are the, the processes that are going on, how much access do the children or the adults have to the processes that are going on. Um, one thing that we tried to do is we tried seeing if we gave the adults the options, would they behave differently? And they did, so that if you said to them, okay, look, here's two options. This could be conjunctive or it could be uh, disjunctive. Um, they were looked a little more like the kids in the conjunctive condition, but they also changed their baseline ratings of how probable they thought those options were. So it was hard to, it was hard to sort of just get at, is this a problem about generating hypotheses versus, you know, selecting among hypotheses? Um, we haven't quite figured out a way. We thought that might be a way of testing this, and we haven't quite figured out a way of doing that. Yeah. Towards the end, you mentioned that the um, Roughly, these searches are um, hot, but they're not completely hot, right? Mm -hmm. Which is to say, yeah. there's a certain plausibility about the sort of yeah. decisions children are making, which are all the hypotheses they're considering, which I thought was kind of interesting because, to my mind, and this may be a failure of imagination on my part, the conjunctive rule is really weird if you're yeah. dealing with typical causal situations. Right. So if you think about that in the evolution of life history context, where the story is something like, you know, these lots of different environments, and so we want to be really plastic so we can adapt ourselves to these various environments. There aren't very many environments where the conjunctive rule is a good rule to go with. Right. Right. And so it's a bit odd that um, the, because that looks like a very hot search. Yeah. Given the sorts of environments I take it we're imagining. So yeah. It's interesting that if that's right, it seems like this experimental evidence seems to be sort of over, they're over hot. Yeah. Yeah, that's I mean that's an interesting that's an interesting point, but it's also connects to you know, there's these interesting tensions when you just look at say preschoolers, where if you look at something like their pretend play, one of the things that's puzzling, so I've had a long argument about thinking about pretend play as being a, a, a giving you an ability to practice counterfactual inference. But one of the things that's interesting is so you would think if you were just practicing counterfactual inference, you would do sort of useful counterfactuals. You wouldn't do there's a 5 foot you know, 20 foot dinosaur who's purple and he has a funny tail and his, you know, name is Broxy and he lives in Antarctica. And, you know, it doesn't feel like that's a very useful counterfactual for any normal human purposes. But those are the kind of counterfactuals that children very characteristically are, are generating in their pretend play. So I think it is interesting that that this is true. But on the other hand, I mean, if you're thinking about potential environments, uh, you know, one way I put it is the human um, adaptive niche is the unknown unknowns. So even if now there aren't, you know, a lot of conjunctive causal structure, um, I mean, here's, here's actually a very nice example of this. So uh, think about action at a distance, right? So one of the things that we did was try and see, uh, we haven't done this with adults and children, but we kind of kind of like to. One of the things we did early on was to see how do children deal with causation that's happening at a distance? Do they treat it as if that's got a low prior? And what we discovered was that at baseline, they're more likely to think that the de detector works if you put things on it than if you wave things over top of it. But you give them five pieces of data, less than that, four pieces of data, and they're perfectly happy to generalize to 
uh, to thinking that it's at a distance. Now, again, in the environments in which we adapt, you know, that we adapted to, there weren't very many examples of physical causation with no mechanism. But of course, now we're in an environment where that's completely ubiquitous, and children don't seem to have any trouble at all. And uh, you know, think about any two-year-old, you know, like my 18-month-old. Uh, grandson uh, who thinks goes to remotes immediately. When the remote goes missing in our house, we look at all of the things that are like this high, all the potential, all the potential toddler height hiding places. So, so you know, even though we, it might be different in those environments, I think the whole point about human beings is this capacity to adapt to completely novel environments. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, but I'd like to talk more about the variation within open source and right. more socioeconomic results. Uh, that's really striking that the kids who are um, you know, labeled as needing something are uh, fantastic causal learners. What do you think um, your results mean for the sort of pathologization of? Uh, childhood behavior and medicalization of certain childhood yeah, behavior yeah. that a lot of people are worrying about. Yeah. Yeah, well I mean one of the one of the examples that I I talk about sometimes in you know, a sort of obvious thought is that if you think about um, a lot of the behaviors that we typically think of as being sort of dysfunctional in childhood in general and really dysfunctional if they're produced a lot in individual children, like not being able to sit still and uh, looking at everything else that's going on around you and not focusing and moving around a lot and being fidgety. I mean, from the perspective of the explore uh, uh, piece, those are all exactly what you'd want. You'd want to be impulsive. You'd want to get into everything. You'd want to pay attention to everything that's going on around you. Uh, one of the things I sometimes say is it's not that children are bad at paying attention, they're bad at not paying attention. That's the thing that they're, they're really not, not good at. Um, and especially if you're in a school, this is, goes back to what Michelle was saying, especially if you're in a culture where school is extremely valued, um, then those kinds of properties might get devalued and even pathologized or, or, uh, or medicalized, both in kind of the regular population and, and especially in other uh, kinds of populations. So, uh, I mean, I think an obvious example is like in America, kids are getting drugged for ADHD when they're three which is just insane, right? I mean, that's just crazy. Um, so so I, I do think that that's part of what's going on is that, uh, and then there's another piece about this, which is that one of the, sa the same moral about developmental variability also applies to individual variability. I was just talking to, to a colleague who's doing evolutionary modeling of the development of um, individual vari variability in, people. And it's almost formally the same story, right? So one way of doing this is to have developmental periods where you have different learning. But you could also do it by having a population, a community where people have, some people are the, the we had just had this workshop, and some people are the mavericks, and some people are the, the hard workers who are working out the details, and some people are, you know, um, uh, Locke, John Locke talked about the faculty of wit and the faculty of judgment. So some people have the faculty of wit, which means that they think up all these crazy ideas, and then some people have the faculty of judgment, which is figuring out which one of them are actually, which ones are actually true. Locke is kind of pro-judgment, which kind of tells you more about Locke, I think, than it does about human nature. But um, uh, Anyway, so yeah, so the idea would be that you might see some of the same kinds of advantages and trade-offs in individual variability that you do in developmental uh, variability. And again, I think the, the, uh, it's kind of like the uh, ladder of nature picture uh, that was such a, it's such a sort of intuitive uh, picture in comparative psychology where it seems to be extremely easy for people to conceptualize cognition and even like neuroscientists, contemporary neuroscientists do this, to conceptualize cognition as if there's, you know, this really, really, really good version which is, you know, basically the, amazingly enough, you know, the white male neuroscientist who's giving the talk, right? You know, that, that, that's like the really good version. And then there's all these kind of defective versions, which are adults and which are animals and, and uh, uh, children and people in other cultures and so forth. So even though it, when you put it that way, everyone says, no, of course, nobody thinks that. But it's still, it's still a very seductive, it's still a very seductive way of thinking about things as opposed to thinking about 
there's trade-offs and you want variety because you want variety to deal with the trade-offs. Um, we're almost out of time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, because it was a bit too fast, but uh, when you presented me the test data on the Blinkert right. test, I, I believe even if you were conditioned under the conjunctive uh, training mm -hmm. set, uh, the test data is still ambiguous. Yes, exactly. Uh, was, if, if that was done on purpose, wouldn't it be kind of normal that when they are presented with the two possible answers, they would choose as adults the simplest one or the simplest explanation? Well, the point is, it's not the simplest explanation. It's not the, so. The the trade-off is the explanation that fits best with the training data that you've already seen, versus the explanation that fits best with your sort of prior hypothesis. So, if you no, because if you look at so, let me get back and I can show you. Um, sorry. Okay, so, so if you've got the conjunctive training, that tells you that this, and you believe that this is characteristic of the way this machine works in general. So what you'd have to do to give the disjunctive response in the ambiguous, this is, pur we purposely made this t ambiguous for exactly this reason, uh, means that essentially what you're saying is, oh, the machine has, is now working on a different general principle than it was a minute ago when I saw the A, B, and C blocks on it, right? That's the only, that, that's what you'd have to believe if you, if you went with the uh, disjunctive answer, if you said it was just F in the, in the, in the I, test I case. No, I could still believe that the, the conjunction is still valid if F by itself would still be a thing. I don't, I don't see it contradicting the conjunctive. Well, because the conjunct, so the conjunctive hypothesis is, if you look at the conjunctive training, it's telling you that none of the blocks individually makes the machine go, right? The only time that a block makes a machine go is in conjunction with the other block. Yeah, okay, I assume it will be different blocks given they have different names. Okay. Yeah, so this is a, a, B, and C, right? So the, each of these is the individual blocks. Yeah. None of the individual blocks make it go, okay? Yeah, and the, no, that's right. So D, A, and F are different blocks. So one thing you could assume is these blocks work differently from the blocks that I just saw. So you could assume that, and presumably that's kind of what the uh, adults are, are, are assuming. So it's a bit like um, uh, in science when you have uh, uh, auxiliary hypotheses, right? So you might say, oh, okay, here's the, the general principle is right, but uh, there's an epicycle that I can use to explain why it's happening in this particular case versus, so that's a move that you can always make. And in effect, you know, that may be what the, uh, the adults are doing is they're saying, they're saying, well, there's just something else that was going on that was weird in this case. Um, um, but the other thing you could do is you could think, oh, my general higher order assumption was wrong and I should change the general higher order assumption and that seems to be more like what the kids are doing. Because, I mean, the fact that A and C work together does not exclude that F by itself would work as well. No, that's right. But what that would mean is that F works on a really different abstract logical principle than A, B, and C does. So if you're thinking about simplicity, it means that... I fail to agree with that. <laughs> okay, we can... No, I mean, the fact that they have the conjunction possibility does not mean that every solution will have to be a pairwise conjunction. Right, so you could, as I say, you could think that sometimes the machine works on a conjunctive principle and sometimes it works on a disjunctive principle, and since most machines work most of the time on a disjunctive principle, the disjunctive option is more, the disjunctive option is more likely. No, you could certainly think that. And one, of, but it's kind of interesting, I mean, I think we've, again, this is part of what we're trying to do with the adults, but we haven't quite worked it out. I think that the phenomenology that people have when you do this, like when I gave it to, to you guys, is not, oh yeah, right, that was, I, I knew that that was a possibility all along. I just thought that it was less likely. The phenomenology you have is sort of, oh shit, you know, I, I, stupid, you know, why didn't I think of that? That was the other option. And it's interesting, by the way, that uh, one of the cases where you see kids, one of the other cases where you see kids doing, younger kids doing better than older kids doing better than adults, is in insight tasks. So if you take a kind of classic tool use insight task, like you, you, know, uh, you, you see a box full of tacks, and it turns out that to be able to solve the problem, you have to treat the box not as if it's a container, but as if it's a block that you build things with. And it turns out that 
children, younger children, actually show less of this kind of functional fixedness, this assumption that things work just one way than adults do. And again, the phenomenology, I think the phenomenology in these cases may be kind of like, is more, kind of more like that, where you say, oh, I didn't, I didn't think about that. But we haven't, we haven't nailed that down. It could be, it could also be, and it would still be interesting that what you're doing is saying, well, maybe this is stochastic. Maybe this one's just, you know, or maybe the conjunctive one, it, maybe it isn't really conjunctive. Maybe it's that sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work. You could, you could think of a lot of different hypotheses. That gets to Marta's question about what's going on underneath. Um, I, I, I'm afraid we're out of time. So apologies. There were, there were several people still waiting to ask questions. Um, Alison, as you know, um, CFI is trying to be a highly multidisciplinary um, <laughs> center. And, and as Stephen said at the beginning, one of the, the remarkable things about your career is the way in which you've been such a successful person working across these disciplinary boundaries. And listening to your talk, two things occurred to me. One was that it might, that might be associated with an admirable failure to grow up <laughs> in your case. But secondly, that we might be able to test that hypothesis in CFI. Now, initially, I was thinking we could do it by um, uh, sort of suppressing the, the, the frontal lobes in some of the post <laughs> yeah. that, does, that doesn't work with Berkeley undergraduates. So I think we'll have to try a different strategy. We'll try appointing four-year-olds to some of the post yeah. yeah. positions. That, that, well, I mean, yeah. this is one of the reasons why, here's, here's a piece of advice of sorts, which is that, you know, one of the reasons why I think hanging out with children is so great, why being a, a caregiver is so great, is because on the one hand, it's this incredibly adult task where you get to really completely fulfill these adult functions of being responsible. But on the other hand, you get to be a four-year-old. So at least what you could do is bring a bunch of four-year-olds into uh, to CFI. Or another piece about this, of course, is it's because of all those mothers and ally parents and fathers that this is possible at all. If it weren't for the if it weren't for the nurturers who were providing the safe space to do this exploration, this wouldn't happen. So I think another way you could think about, and I have actually argued for this, is a place like CFI and people like you and Steve are just very good mamas. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the principle. So by being very, very good mamas, you can encourage this kind of uh, exploration. Well, well, for me, it's a sort of substitute for grandchildren. Because they're, they're <laughs> the plan. Yeah. But uh, thank you very much, Alex. Okay. Thank you.